Well, thank you for that warm afternoon after lunch welcome. Uh, so I'm going to start off talking about uh, Jupyter Notebooks, uh, both what they generally are for those of you who aren't too familiar with them, and then I'm going to talk about uh, the kind of current theme of trying to host these things in the cloud and kind of <clears throat> what pros and cons there are and what options there are and just kind of what you can do with them. So to begin with, uh, Jupyter is something that Fernando Perez and Brian uh, Ellison developed and for what uh, I've heard Fernando coin as literate computing. It's basically the idea that there's a lot of stuff to go around computation. And it, it's one thing to crunch a bunch of numbers and come out with a graph or a chart or something, and, or just some number, right? But there's usually a huge amount of information going behind that computation, that uh, actual computation to come to that result, right? So think of like research papers. You don't just get a research paper and just all you have is a bunch of graphs and some numbers with no context, right? There's always some textual explanation behind why that thing is. And Jupyter Notebooks are for that. Um, it's for literate computing, basically. Uh, data scientists love these things for this exact reason, because in, for a data scientist, what you're doing is you're taking in information, analyzing it, and coming to a result, but you need to explain how you got your data, how you cleaned it up, how you analyzed it, how you came to your conclusions. I mean, very much have to explain all your steps. Now, this isn't to mean that Jupyter Notebooks are only for data scientists. For instance, I find um, Jupyter Notebooks really handy for API design, right? So when I am thinking about an idea and I just want to write out why I came to this design, I start out writing out like, okay, here's the problem I'm trying to solve. Here's how other people have tried to solve it before. Here's how I think it'll work. Actually type out the code uh, and then go, okay, here's why I think this works out. Try, put in some actual examples. And that leads to a, basically a document explaining how I reached this API design, which I would hope you all would support because if I screw up a design in Python, you're all going to have to suffer with it for the rest of your lives and that's never fun. But I do encourage all of you to do this for your own API designs because any API you design, you will have to live with for the rest of your lives until you you might get that magical chance to rewrite all your code, uh, which we know never happens. Um, anyway, so just to give you a flavor of what Jupyter is, basically Jupyter starts you off with this file browser, um, real basic. But basically what it allows you to do is you can open these, I, these IPy and B files. By the way, I'm going to try to do all this live, so I am poking the bear here with the demo stick, and we'll see if I get mauled or if I actually survive and turn out better than Leonardo DiCaprio in The Revenant. <laughs> so. Basically, the structure of Jupyter is basically a, or a sequence of what are called cells. And cells just basically contain information. And cells are of different types. Uh, one of the most basic ones is the markdown cell. So what you can do is you can basically write your text using markdown. I mean, we're all, I think pretty much everyone in this room has probably see, at least seen markdown. But it's fairly readable text that can actually be rendered cleanly. So what you can do here is you can just write your text as necessary. And what you can do is you can just uh, till <coughs> with keyboard shortcuts or by clicking uh, actually run cell, uh, basically tell uh, Jupyter, I want this cell to be rendered and look nice. But the really big thing here is you can end up with things uh, that are actual blocks of code. So I'm going to take this out because this current running doesn't work. But what I can do here is I can change these numbers on the fly. And as you can see, 5 divided by 2 is 2.5 in Python 3. We can change that to 5 divided by 3 and instantly get the result. Now, what makes this great is it makes it really easy to experiment, right? So this notebook, for instance, is uh, a port of the official Python how-to and how to port from Python 2 to Python 3. So let's say I wrote this document, which I did. Uh, and you guys wanted to import some of your code to Python 3. And you were going through this, and you saw some examples such as that. And you want to see, well, OK, but what about this case? You can literally launch this notebook, type in your example, run it, and have it instantly show up the way with the proper result that you were expecting. So it's really great for exploring data and code that someone has just handed to you. So there's a real sharing aspect here of ex uh, experimentation uh, that's fantastic. <clears throat> The problem is, as you'll notice, I'm running on my local host. Uh, I'm not going to give you socket access to my machine to run these. So I got to somehow get this notebook to you for you to be able to play with it, or at least even view it, right? Because um, IPy and B files are JSON, and 
not the most readable things in the way they're structured, because they're structured for rendering, not for human editing. So what's happened is, is Jupyter Notebooks have started, to, people have tried to find ways now to kind of not just use notebooks for themselves, but get them out to the world so others can actually use them. So what I'm gonna do is, this is a repo I have up on GitHub. If you'll notice, the repo basically has nothing more than just uh, that same IPy NB file, uh, and license to readme, no big deal. Uh, but basically, there's a couple places online that will actually show you a rendered version of notebooks. So for instance, GitHub itself actually will render an uh, IPy and B file for you right then and there. Now, the reason this works is you'll notice even the code samples actually have results. This isn't because GitHub actually ran the code for me, because the way Jupyter works is basically when you say execute this cell, if it's code, uh, Jupyter has concepts of something called a kernel, much like an OS kernel, and basically what it does is it just sends the code to the kernel and says, hey kernel, can you run this for me? And the kernel goes, okay, the result was this, and then Jupyter will show it. So it's actually executing this code. GitHub does not trust me <laughs> to not write some malicious code. So they didn't actually run this code. What, ha what happens is, is IPy and B files actually cache the results of these files, which is important when you're sharing this information with people, right? Because if for instance, I did some astronomy simulation and it took me five hours to run. I don't want to hand this file out to people and say, all right, now you run it for five hours and you can see you get the exact same number. Isn't that great? It's easier to just say, here's the number right then and there. It happened to take me five hours. If you want to run it again, the code's right there in line and you can verify, tweak the parameters, whatever. But by caching it, it makes it very simple and self-contained to ship these files around. Uh, now, personally, I don't, love GitHub's styling of this. It's not my favorite. Um, the Jupyter project actually provides a project called nbviewer.jupyter.org. Um, don't forget the Y, by the way. Uh, and I actually prefer this rendering. This is the exact same rendering of the exact same notebook. It will cache it, but I find it tends to look a little better. And uh, one nice thing about nbviewer is it tends to render certain uh, extensions and other uh, things that, Jupiter, that are in the Jupyter ecosystem a little better. So for instance, one of the big things Jupyter provides is an easy way to embed plots. So bar charts, maps, uh, all that kind of stuff. And uh, I find GitHub doesn't always have all of the uh, extensions necessary to render them because they'll statically include the f details, but you still need the extension to actually do the rendering properly. And MB Viewer tends to have a slightly better job of actually providing those extensions to actually have those render properly. So for me personally, if you want to take the time, I typically try to view in um, anything on GitHub on mbviewer.jupyter.org if I just wanted to get a uh, straight uh, render of a notebook. Now, once again, these are read only, which is great, but you might want to play with stuff, right? So what you can do is there's a service uh, <laughs> provided by the Jupyter project called tempnb.org, so T-M-P, nb.org, and basically what this will do is we'll launch up a container and basically just give you a running uh, instance of Jupyter for you to just use. Now, obviously it comes with caveats because it's free, like you only use so much CPU and memory so you don't drive their costs up, and when you close it, it's gone, right? It doesn't stick around, it's totally ephemeral, but it's there. Uh, it starts off with a couple uh, notebooks for you to play with, so if you want to look at R or learn little Haskell or Julia. There's Python in there obviously as well. Uh, this is a quick way to just try Jupyter in the browser real quick, see if you like it without having to install it. Um, it comes standard with Anaconda. So if you're in the data science world, I'm sure you're aware of Anaconda. Uh, you can also pip install uh, Jupyter and it'll come with the notebooks or um, I believe it's pip install notebook. Um, but basically this is a nice way if you just want to play with it or if you just found a random notebook and you want to put it up uh, somewhere and actually execute it and play with it live without having to install all of Jupyter on your machine. That's, this is one way to do it. And I should say one of the ways that these cloud hosts start to kind of differentiate themselves from running on your own machine is it's not your machine. Like I'm sure my laptop is nice and all, but it can't compare to um, a 16 core machine up in the cloud somewhere or have more memory or something I want to leave running in the background while I'm trying to get other work done. And so that can go use CPU off there in the cloud and I don't have to worry about it. So there's definitely some benefits to doing that. Uh, one of the drawbacks though that can be 
is dependencies. Like if it's running on your machine, you completely control quite, quite easily installing dependencies once. With these kind of ephemeral installs, what you tend to have to do is do a pip install, or if you're running, if they're happy to have Anaconda behind the uh, behind the scenes, do Conda install, and that's basically what you have to do. Uh, anyway, after that, there's mybinder.org uh, as a quick way to actually launch uh, notebooks out of uh, GitHub. Uh, once again, this is ephemeral though, but it does kind of run a little farther. Uh, but the current thing, which I have to admit I'm on the team of, is uh, Microsoft Azure Notebooks, so notebooks.azure.com. These aren't ephemeral. You can actually store these. Uh, we'll actually give you things called libraries that you can actually share and clone with people, and any changes you make will actually be stored, which is the one differentiator on our end. And I'm being told I'm out of time, so mm -hmm. if you have any questions, just find me outside and I'll happily answer them. Thank you. Unfortunately, yeah. Uh, give everyone, everyone give a hand. Thanks.